everyone, and welcome to the Boating Education Standards Knowledge and Skills webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a couple of logistics. If you're not listening through your computer, you may dial in uh, on audio, for audio through your phone. Uh, you should see a number for uh, U.S. participants and a separate number for Canadian participants, both using the same uh, access code. All participants are on mute during the call. If you have questions um, during the call, please use the chat function that you see, and that will go to the chairperson, and they will alert the speaker that there are questions. If you have technical difficulties anytime during the call, please email ron at nasblod.org or you can use the chat box if that screen is open. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be posted at www.nasblog.org slash webinars, and there you can also see additional offerings for webinars this fall. Uh, to get us started, I'd like to do a quick poll to get you uh, used to this feature. Uh, if you could, go ahead and answer the question here, who do you represent? Are you part of a state agency, a nonprofit organization, uh, a commercial course provider, an individual instructor, or others? And we have about 26 folks on the call, 40%. Uh, uh, seem to be from state agencies and the uh, almost 23% from nonprofits. And anyone else voting? And we'll go on. There's the final results. And now, without further ado, we'll get started with the webinar. We have four presenters today. The first is Joe Gatfield, the chair of the National Boating Education Standards Panel. We also have Jeff Ricks, uh, a member of the Education Standards Panel and National On Water Standards Team. Brian Dorval is a National On Water Standards Team project facilitator. And we have Pam Dillon, NASBLA's Director for Education and Standards. First up, Joe Gatfield uh, has been active with NASBLA's National Education Standards Panel since its creation in 2011 and currently serves as the panel's chair. He's also the immediate past chief commander of the Canadian Power and Sail Squadrons. And with that, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Boating Education Standards in 1999 and have been amended seven times since then. These prescribe the minimum body of knowledge effect to affect safe, legal, and enjoyable recreational boating and have served as the basis for boating education courses approved by NASBLA and recognized by the United States Coast Guard. In 2009, separate paddle sports education standards developed in conjunction with the American Canoe Association, ACA, for the purposes of addressing manually powered vessels were adopted by NASBLA membership. Today, the national education standards are referenced in numerous state laws and regulations as the minimum criteria for state-mandated boater education. However, several state legislators, legislatures have enacted process rules in conflict with these standards. Next slide, please, Ron. In order that we all have a better understanding about our audience's knowledge of standards, please answer our second poll. What previous experience do you have with boating education standards? Check all that apply. Please go ahead. And Joe, we've got uh, 30 people participating, so 
50% uh, there is 15 folks. Great, thanks, thanks, Ron. Um, it looks like we have um, most have been involved with standards and are familiar with the process. A um, couple trying to figure it out, and and we've got some that have have none whatsoever. And today we will help you try and understand that somewhat. Next slide, please, Ron. You you hear us refer to ANSI, which stands for American National Standards Institute. We certainly don't have the time today to go very in depth on this topic. However, the current slide directs you to www.standardslearn.org, where you can learn a tremendous amount about ANSI and just a few of the things that you'll, you can get on this particular uh, site. Uh, short course through the history with standards, U.S. standard systems today and tomorrow, short course legal issues on standard setting, uh, another area is an introduction to standards, why, where, and how they were developed. And for those of you familiar with ISO, the International Standards Organization, there's not a lot of difference there. NASBLA is now a standards developer organization, referred to as SDO, and we're taking the National Boating Education Standards through the ANSI process. Once completed and ANSI is achieved, then the standard becomes the minimum any course created must follow. Currently, the powerboat standards is about to be submitted to ANSI after having gone through the various calls for revisions to the public the past two years. The standard is called NASBLA-103-201X, and X will refer to probably six basic boating knowledge-power. Next, next slide, please, Ron. There are two separate groups working on boating education standards and skills standards. The Education Standards Panel, ESP, is sponsored by NASBLA, and the National on Water Standards, NOWS, is sponsored by U.S. Sailing. Both groups receive funding and support from the United States Coast Guard and are both following the ANSI process. Next slide, please, Ron. Together, the National Education Standards Panel and the National on Water Standards have 11 standards in process, including po the power, human propelled, and sail domains. Knowledge and skills, as well as operator readiness, trailering, water jet propelled, and core boating standard. The two websites referenced will lead you to all the standards being worked on by ESB and NOWS. They are all posted and are all available for download. This contact info will appear later at the end of the webinar and, of course, um, is available to you at any time. Ron, are there any questions at this time? Um, none. Let me check. If anyone's got any questions, again, please submit them through the uh, chat box. And I'll wait just a second or more to see if anybody has any questions. Okay. okay. Uh, if you come up with one, there will be time at the end of the entire webinar. Uh, to ask those as well. Thanks, um, Ron. Uh, yes. Next slide. I'd now like to introduce Jeff Ricks to introduce an overview of the work being done to align the knowledge and skill standards. Jeff? Thank you very much, Joe, and good day, everyone. It's a privilege to be with you today on this web conference, and uh, I look forward to uh, working with you. My purpose today is to try to give a, sort of a foundational understanding of the two main different types of recreational boating standards that we have uh, in work right now, those being in the knowledge area as well as in the skills area. To get things started, if we could go ahead and move to the poll, Ron, I'd like to ask you all in the audience to answer this poll. On an inland lake during the daytime, which of the following would you feel confident operating? and please check all of the boxes that apply to you.
we'll give that just a few more seconds, and then, Ron, if you'll let me know when the poll is uh, finishing up. Yep. Okay, uh, we had 25 answering this poll. Great. So you can see the results there if you voted, and this is very helpful for us. As you can see, we do have a, a, a diverse audience. Many of you have operated different types of uh, craft on the water, uh, certainly in different domains that we're going to talk about here in a minute. So with that, I'd like to go to the next slide if we could. This is what we call our standards big picture. This is a matrix of many of the standards that Joe mentioned a few minutes ago. He said we were in process working on 11 standards. Well, here is a subset of those. We might call these sort of the major ones that we're working on. And the reason that poll was interesting to me is if you look in the left-hand column there, the one that's labeled type and domain, we have what we call three different types of domains here. One is called the human-propelled domain, and it's been known by several names in the past, including paddle sports. But this are, these are things like canoes and stand-up paddleboards and kayaks and rowboats. We have, of course, the sailing domain. That one's pretty obvious, as well as the power domain, anything with an engine attached to it. So those are our three principal domains that we're working. Now, if you look across the horizontal part of the page there, you're going to see two main columns or categories of different types of standards. On the left, we see the knowledge, and that's further broken into sort of two different subtypes of standards. And then on the right, we have the skills. So given what Joe said before about we have two different organizations that are working on the knowledge and skills, what we've been doing over the past uh, year or more is really trying to work very closely together to make sure that these knowledge and skills will be seamless and work together so that someone who wants to create a course or assess someone's capability will be able to go to these standards and use them effectively. What I'd like to do now on the next slide is discuss sort of the content of these different types of standards. And then in just a minute, we're going to use a little bit of an analogy to help everybody understand. So on the knowledge side, we have two different types of standards. We have what we call the basic boating knowledge uh, in the three domains of power, sail, and human propelled. And this is what we call our safe boating or risk-based standards. This is a very sort of bare bones fundamental uh, knowledge that everybody needs to have in order to be safe when they're operating a vessel. The other type of knowledge standard that we have down there on the second line is what we call operational knowledge. It's one thing to know about these risk-based elements, but also you need to know a little bit about how the vessel works and different skills that you might need to know about in order to be able to use those skills once you get into the skill side. So that's knowing how to operate. And then finally, we get down to the actual skills themselves. So this is things like uh, being able to actually put on a life jacket in addition to knowing that you need to wear one and have one on your boat. And the bulk of the operator skills are actually about the maneuvers themselves, the way that you would operate the vessel in, in different scenarios, using different controls, depending upon what the domain is, uh, in order to maneuver the craft safely. Next slide. In order to illustrate this, perhaps a little bit more effectively, I do like to use a bicycle analogy. My assumption is, is that most people, or perhaps every one of you in the audience, has at one time or another ridden a bicycle or certainly seen somebody else ride one. So I think pretty much everybody is familiar with a bicycle. For this, what we're going to do is create a virtual uh, sort of short version standard for a bicycle. And we're going to look at three different types of standards, the uh, risk-based standard, the operational knowledge, as well as the skills. Next slide. So on the risk-based side, again, this is basic fundamental knowledge that everybody needs to have in order to stay safe. Certainly, we'd like to know what the safety equipment uh, should be for someone riding a bicycle, such as a helmet and perhaps eye protection. We need to be able to know what hazards to look out for. Perhaps there's something blocking our path as we're trying to ride down the pathway. You can see in the picture there that someone wasn't aware of this rock that was in, the, in their way. And, looks like they're about to have a pretty nasty scrape on parts of their body. 
Also, we'd like to know what the preventative maintenance tasks are that need to be performed in order to keep our, our equipment in operational order. And finally, we might be able to know uh, about transporting our bicycle from our home to the place that we want to ride it. So describing safe bicycle transportation. So again, these are all safety or risk-based knowledge elements that we would find in a knowledge-based standard. Next slide. The other type of knowledge that's good to have is what we call operational knowledge. So beyond the basic safety gear and hazards and things like that, we actually want to know how to do certain things, such as how to mount a bicycle without falling over. Perhaps we want to know how to ride uh, the bike and uphold a, an appropriate posture. And so the way that we would write that element within the operational knowledge standard would be describe the appropriate riding posture. And finally on the slide, we see something about balance. Depending upon the type of activity that we're doing, we need to be able to describe how to maintain balance, whether it's just simple riding down the highway or the bike path, or if it is in fact participating in some kind of uh, a show that you might be able to have skills that are well beyond the entry level. Next slide. Now we get into the skills area. The previous two slides, we've talked about risk-based knowledge, and we talked about operational knowledge. Now we're going to move into the skill side. This is where you're actually going to be able to observe behaviors. And so the way that we write these standard elements are a little bit differently. You'll notice there's a part A and a part B, as well as a stem that leads into those phrases. The picture on the left shows someone riding a bicycle and he's looking, looking over his left shoulder. And the implication when I saw this photo was that he's probably going to move over to the left. And so the way that we would write this standard element is the cyclist will be able to change lanes performing a visual scan. We can write rubrics around these that allow us to assess how well that bicyclist uh, performed that skill. The one on the right, the cyclist will be able to steer straight for five boat lengths sorry, bike lengths, maintaining a two-hand grip on the handlebars. I laugh when I said five boat lengths because it's, it's pretty neat. We're about to get back into boating, which is what we're really here for. So let's move on to the next slide. What we're going to do now is come back into our recreational boating world. Now that we've looked at the bicycle analogy and you have a good sense of what these different types of standards are, let's look at each of the three domains of human propelled and of sailing and of power voting. This one is power. The three different types of standards are listed at the top in the blue section, and these are actual elements that have been excerpted from the standards that we have in work. On the left, we have the knowledge, uh, the basic knowledge for power, in other words, the safety or risk-based standard, and we're talking about boats capacities here. In the center, we have operational knowledge, ways to get on board the boat while keeping it stable. And on the right, we have the skills, actually getting on the boat, using three points of contact and distributing persons and gear while maintaining stability. So you see how all three of these are similar. They're related, though they're worded slightly differently. The idea is to try to be able to cover the spectrum from basic safety knowledge to operational knowledge and skills in a seamless fashion. Let's move on to the next slide, and we're going to look at the human propelled domain. Similarly, we have the three different types of standards, the basic knowledge for risk space, the operational, and the on-water skills. This time, we're looking at navigation rules. So on the left-hand side, it's knowing the rules. In the center, it's actually uh, using those rules in an operational fashion from a knowledge perspective. So maybe we start to look at pictures or drawing diagrams. And then on the right, we're actually going to put those skills into practice. So it's one thing to know the rules, but then it's another thing to actually know which direction to turn your boat in order to safely avoid a potential collision. On the next slide, we're going to see the sailing. Now, here's something a little bit different. On the previous two slides, we had three columns, three different types of standards. The reason for that is that the power domain knowledge standard and the human propelled knowledge standard, both of those have been around for a while. 
several years at least, and in, in the case of the power one, you're actually looking at a much longer period of time. In the sailing domain, there was no knowledge standard up until we drafted one just a few months ago. And so what we decided to do in this domain was to combine the risk-based and the operational knowledge into one single standard while we had the opportunity, since it was a clean sheet of paper, we wanted to try this method to see if it made sense. The ESP, or the Education Standards Panel, reviewed that, and they seemed to like how it's going, so we went ahead and posted that for public review. It's up now, and I'm sure Pam will talk more about that later. But here you see we're combining the risk-based and the operational knowledge, and two elements that we plucked out of that standard include stowing and securing gear, methods for boarding, and then, of course, the ability to perform those skills on the right-hand column. Next slide. As I mentioned before, the goal here is to join knowledge and skills, even though they're being created by different organizations, these two different types of standards, and in some cases, three different types of standards. We're joining them together in a seamless fashion so that we have a continuum that anyone can use these standards, whether they're creating a course or whether they're assessing someone's performance, the idea is to make these easy to use and that we get them out there and use as much as possible. With that, I'll ask Ron if there are any questions that have been submitted. Uh, there are none at this time. Um, okay, let's again. move to the next slide. Okay. And while you're looking at this transition slide, we'll I'll give you a chance to enter some questions in the chat box. Again, back to our matrix, looking at the two different types of standards, knowledge, and skills, as well as the three domains. And Ron, I'll turn it back over to you to see if there's any questions. Nope. Not at this time. Okay, then we can move on to the next. And it's time for Pam Dillon to talk about the knowledge standards. Go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everyone. I'll be reviewing the knowledge standards. And these are the standards that are typically used in a classroom or an online course. Um, but they can also be incorporated into skills courses, as Jeff and, and Joe have already indicated. For the purpose of this conversation, I want to focus on the classroom or the online type of course offering. So go to the next slide, please, Ron. And let's begin with a polling question. Please indicate the highest voting knowledge credential you have earned, and I would, I would say, pertaining to a classroom or an online course. Um, if you don't have any, uh, if you're new to it, uh, you can indicate that. If you've only self-studied, haven't learned a, earned a certificate, um, or if you've completed a boating, uh, basic boating course, if you're a knowledge course instructor, an instructor trainer, or a course developer, uh, please indicate that and submit those as well. And after you submit, you can see that uh, we've got some pretty knowledgeable people on the webinar. Uh, we've got quite a number of, uh, looks like, course instructors, a few instructor trainers, and a good percentage of you have also developed courses. Uh, so that's, uh, that's good to know, especially as we're moving forward. But we've got a couple that say, I'm new to all this, so I don't want to uh, miss out on making sure we provide you information here that is relevant to you. Uh, Ron, you want to close that out, please? Mm -hmm. This slide uh, goes back to what Joe was talking about earlier. Uh, about the, and I'm going to focus now on the knowledge part and the work specifically of the Education Standards Panel. Um, the Education Standards Panel primarily is focused on knowledge-based standards. Uh, we've been focusing on the human propelled, the SAIL, and the power standards, as has been discussed. But we have additional standards that are being considered beyond those that are just aligning with the, the three skill standards. As you can see from this matrix, we've included the development of a core boating standard, that's the one in yellow there, that uh, addresses passenger safety, maybe somebody that um, 
is just riding on a boat and they want to know basic safety and risk management principles, but they never intend, or at least at this point in their lives, they don't intend to actually operate the boat. That's in uh, development. And earlier, Joe Gapfield mentioned that the work for the trailering and also a water jet propelled standard. Next slide, please. There's actually three of these that are open for comment now. And there's a lot of content available in each of these draft standards. But you have the app opportunity now to submit comments, to review and to submit comments on uh, these three circled draft standards. The starting at the top and going down, uh, basic boating knowledge, human propelled boats and then the sales standard, and then the trailering standard. And I'm going to give you some information on how you can actually participate in this process. Next slide, please. You submit your comments on the knowledge standards through the Easy ESP web tool. It's a free website. You do need to register on the website. And once you do, you actually receive um, regular updates on the status of the work of the Education Standards Panel, and it is also the web tool uh, where you can submit your comments. Next slide, please. You can register at this tool uh, at esp.nasbla.org forward slash ESP. There's also a link to it on the NASBLA website. Once you're on the site, you'll see a separate listing for each of the individual standards that are, um, that are being developed and have been posted as a, um, as a draft standard. Here you see a basic announcement and a basic slide indicating the sailing standard is open. Next slide, please. There's actually three different key areas I want to call your attention to on this website. At the very top of the site, if you want to just go in and download all the documents about all the individual standards and uh, review the information from the uh, Education Standards Panel's previous meetings, the public review comments, everything uh, regarding the standards work, there's a link at the top of the page under my panel there. It's the red arrow here that says Download All Documents as Zip. And there you can find the complete um, history, the, the, all the, the approved meeting minutes of the Education Standards Panel. Um, before you hit print on your uh, printer though, just be aware that there's hundreds of pages involved with some of these uh, sets of meeting minutes. If you go down, this that is there for your uh, review, and you can certainly download them and have access to them electronically. If you go down this, the page here to the yellow area, if you have an interest in just one of the you know, several standards that might be posted, and you just want to look at the current uh, draft that is open for public review or public comment, you can find that under the individual document link. Here it's linked as um, under the sales standard is linked next to that uh, yellow arrow, arrow. And if you go on down and you have downloaded that, you've printed it off, you see a place where you'd like to submit a comment, the same web page has the add a comment feature, and that's the bottom uh, dark arrow. Uh, if you open that up, it gives you a very, very easy uh, platform that you can submit your comment and most importantly, tell us how you would like to see it changed. Next slide, please. When you open up your documents, uh, when you download a document and you're reading it for review, you'll see that we actually have shown the changes as we go through the progression of review comments. We show the changes from one, um, one revision to the next so that you might open up a, a document and see that if there have been previous comments that have been considered and they have resulted in changes in that draft standard, 
those will be um, noted. They'll be, you'll be able to easily see the track changes um, that are part of that. This is an example, of course, of the of basic boating knowledge, human propelled. Uh, we now call it human propelled boats. Previously, it was paddle sports, et cetera. Uh, you'll also see that each standard starts with the title, the scope, and a purpose statement. And in this um, draft standard, the purpose statement, um, under the purpose statement, there's an asterisk that explains the inclusive nature of the word boats. So you see that it includes stand-up paddle boards and rafts, dragon boats, and other types of boats where people may have questions. Next slide, please. As you go farther down into the document again, you'll see the specific changes that are being made. And in these standards that have these type of track changes that have been based on previous uh, posted um, standards and the comments that have been considered, we're asking for you to review and comment on the actual changes that are being recommended. In this case, that would be changing the will to shall, and adding the words and why. You'll also notice that each of these elements have detailed numbers. So if you wanted to submit a comment about the and why uh, section of this element, you would have a place in the web tool where you could go in and just say regarding section 1.1.1.2, you need to and provide your information that you'd like to see considered by the um, Education Standards Panel. Next slide, please. In these types of um, people familiar with this process often ask what the most substantial changes under considerations are. So I wanted to provide you some uh, specific information on what I consider a bit, pretty big change to the Education Standards Panel, especially now that I know that many of you have taught from that standard and have developed courses from that standard. Next slide, please. In this case, we've got uh, Section 5 of the Human Propelled Boat Standard, but this is a similar section as has been, um, as we find in the Power Standard. And under Section 5, we have cold water immersion. This has been um, changed substantially from the, um, the 2012 education standard that has been posted. Um, we've really focused on new information that has moved it from what was priorly, prior standards labeled as hypothermia into what we now call cold water immersion. Next slide, please. And this is the type of detail you'll see regarding that particular topic. Um, it has been labeled as cold water immersion, and the emphasis has been expanded from hypothermia information to information on cold, to include cold water shock response, cold incapacitation, swim failure, and functional loss, which each occurs prior to uh, someone actually becoming hypothermic in the water. Again, for the complete information and to download these drafts, uh, visit the EASY ESP website, but this is the kind of uh, specific updated information you'll find in um, those draft standards. Next page, next slide please. So that was a quick overview of the knowledge standard. They each have a key focus of risk recognition and risk mitigation. And at this time, Ron, do we have any questions? None at this time. Well, obviously, we want voters to process appropriate or to possess appropriate skills for their safe outing. So if there's no questions about the knowledge standard, I'd like to turn this over to Brian Derval to share information about the skills standard. Brian? Great. Great. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate that. Pam's been um, talking about the uh, knowledge side. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about the um, skills side, the skills piece of the puzzle. Um, and so as part of the uh, role that I've had as the project facilitator, we've been looking at all three 
of the domains around skills to try to understand what are those skills that will help um, boaters be safe on the water. So Ron, if you would please, next slide. Let's um, start a little bit with a, um, a poll again that learns a little bit more about you and um, the amount of skills that um, you've completed, so our highest levels of boating skills course completion for you. So if you would let us know that, ranging from I'm a land lover to uh, been in a boat a few times or completed entry skills course uh, or completed advanced skills course or if you're a skills course instructor or instructor trainer or a course developer. Let's see who's listening. Okay. Ron, all the votes in? Uh, no, we got a few more to come in. A few more? Great. All right. Okay. Looks like um, the people that are going to vote are going to vote, and uh, we've got 23 that voted in this one. Great. So 23 folks, thank you for that. And as you can see from the results, we've got the uh, highest percentage of course skills course developers, which is great, and then followed by folks who have completed an advanced skills course themselves, and then uh, closely followed by um, course instructors or instructor trainers, which is great, but also some folks who have completed a course themselves. So all the way through to land lovers. So great to have everybody here thinking about the skills side of things. So what we'll do is we'll talk then about um, the ingredients, the tools that we're trying to make available to folks who want to be able to design courses or provide instruction or who are going through courses and see the kinds of skills that they might learn in those courses. Next slide, please. The um, on-water skills, um, the piece of the puzzle that we're focusing on is skills, and that fits into a larger system. The National On Water um, Standards are part of a larger system called the National System of Standards for Recreational Boat Operation. Uh, and this is uh, an overall system recognized by the Coast Guard that enables all the different pieces associated with safe and enjoyable recreational boat operation and the learning and doing of that uh, to come together and to complement each other to be incorporated in one system that allows us to integrate and find out where we need to create more um, standards or clarify what's needed to attain the highest levels of, of safety on the water as possible, because it's all about that. The National On Water Standards Project is focusing on, from a people perspective, entry-level beginners. So we're looking at those folks in entering the recreational boating world. And so it's the beginner level we're dealing with. The kind of process we're focusing on is an experiential process where it's hands-on, active learning, active-based instruction. And the context, the press or the environment in which the learning takes place is in situ. It's on the water, if you will, where the, the classroom is the boat. And so with those things in mind, the outcomes that this um, Beyond Water Standard skills are designed to identify are skills-based. That's the product. Ron, next slide, please. So the entire project, starting from 2011, is designed to help us figure out that one little word called skills and what is the outcome set of skills that we'd like a beginner to be able to demonstrate that would indicate they can operate a boat more safely and with more enjoyment on the water. So it's all about skills. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the standards themselves, once they're created, um, they'll be freely available and voluntarily applied. Um, so anybody will have access to them, as we talked earlier, will be available on websites. Organizations are allowed um, uh, and encouraged to self-certify that they're following those standards because the Coast Guard would really love them to be used. So self-certifying is, is definitely an option and encouraged. Um, in fact, if you're looking for funding from the Coast Guard, they're going to encourage you to incorporate the skill standards uh, inside of your work so that you're showing support for national system of standards. Uh, the Coast Guard has no plans to require third party. However, they encourage organizations to either self-certify or seek third party um, support to integrate uh, the skills within their, within their programs, whatever they feel more comfortable with. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, the goal of the, the on-water skill standards um, we know there's a full spectrum of skills that exist on the water from expert level 
to someone who has no experience at all, and they may be a passenger or they may be operating the moat. Uh, so in this continuum, the place that it's the, maybe the least clear with is the most ambiguity is that line between the beginner who is safe from the beginner who is unsafe. And that's what the project's designed to figure out, is a, is a way to evaluate uh, an approach that helps us distinguish a safe from an unsafe beginner in that gray space of where who's above the line and who's below the line and how would you know that? So it's all about drawing that line where there's the least amount of clarity at the moment, who's safe and, and who's not safe, and how would you know? What would be the skills they can demonstrate that would suggest they were safe in operating a boat as a beginner? Next slide. To accomplish that goal, we've built a process. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been uh, in place since about 2011, in fact, 2011 in August. Um, and the process begins with um, getting experts together. So whether it's human propelled, um, sailboats or power boats, we've got a team that encompasses all three of those domains together. And we had them develop a draft of what they think those skills are, those skills that would differentiate a safe from an unsafe beginner. And so they agreed to it on paper, came to consensus. But then we wanted to get others' input, so we sent them out through uh, national content validation studies in which we um, sent that information out using SurveyMonkey to get as much input from as many subject matter experts as we could to see how did this team of about 44 people do in coming up with this draft set of standards that identify these skills. And so we reached consensus about that after we processed all the information. But to give you an idea, just in the human uh, propelled domain by itself, we had over 1,100 people give us comments, which was great. So we got lots of comments uh, across all three domains. And that helped us create a good draft on paper. But as we know, we have to go from paper uh, into the context in which the skills are going to be operating to see if what we have on paper is effective at describing, at identifying what those skills are. So to test our thinking, we go into versions three and four, and that's where we field test what we have on paper out in the field in real situations with real people operating real boats. And we do that with a beta test first to make sure our research protocols are going to work. And then we roll out a research project that goes across the country in at least five different venues, and we test what we have on paper to see if it's effective at differentiating a safe from an unsafe beginner when it comes to whatever the domain we're looking at. And then once we have that, now we're in a position, after we've analyzed the results of the research, we're in a good position to have a really good draft, and then it goes into version five, which is then we start the process of submitting it to an ANSI-approved process, but through uh, ANSI submission and hopefully approval so that it can gain the status as we were talking about with the knowledge side on the skills side as well as an American national standard. So that's the process, pretty comprehensive. We've had over 3,000 people involved in the process so far for all three domains. Let's find out what the current status is on each of the domains. Next slide, please. The Coast Guard asked us to begin by looking at the power domain because that's where most of the Injuries and accidents and fatalities were, so we started there in 2011, and we're just about finished. So very shortly, we should have the um, draft approved and to be able to be published as an American national standard, so that's very exciting. And it has 35 skills identified within that standard. And as Jeff was talking about earlier, we were also able to develop some rubrics to help people assess performance on those skills, as well as some tools to help uh, calibrate instructors' observation of those skills in action. So power furthest along. Next slide. When it comes to the human domain, we are just, we just finished the national validation project. We have just done a compression of the data and an analysis, and then we gave it back to the subject matter expert team, and they've done their vote, and that is just about um, – completed as version four, so very shortly that's going to be moving into uh, the creation of version five, so preparing it for submission to American National Standards status uh, through the ANSI approved process, so very close on there as well. Again, the uh, human domain, that has 27 skills identified with it, associated with human-propelled 
um, craft of a variety of kinds. Next slide. And when it comes to the sailing, we're just now starting up the uh, National Validation Project. In fact, on November 9 in California, we'll be doing our first session. We did a beta test. We gathered the data. We have a good sense of how the tools are working. In fact, folks are just about to vote on some of the updates to the standard and the uh, rubrics associated with SAIL. Uh, we have 54 going into that process. We're down closer to the high 30s already, and that's what these uh, on-water field testing is all about, is to see if what we have actually works. We're finding ways that we can compress and create a tighter set of skills. So that's happening already with, with SAIL, but we're just about to roll out the National Validation Project on that, and that'll take us up through June of 2016. So that's our current status on sail, power, and human domains. Next slide. Uh, to give an example of how the skill standards are organized, what's um, involved in each is um, seven basic um, operations, all designed around what is a typical trip out on the water on a Sunday afternoon, from preparing to depart, to leaving your departure point, to you know, close quarter maneuvering out to open water, and eventually, after you've enjoyed yourself, you come back to some destination, secure the boat, and then during that process, you may engage in some safety or, if needed, some emergency procedures. So that's the way we've organized each of the skills-based standards. Next slide. To give you an example of the uh, standard uh, element itself, so inside of the, the power standard, you have these 35 skill-based elements, and these are examples of what uh, is contained in an element. So the bold, for example, get underway is the actual skill. And then you'll see, and that's part A. In part B, you'll see the level of proficiency. And that's information that tells us how we know that skill was demonstrated at a successful level. So getting underway, they're using shift, throttle, and steering, consideration of wind and current, managing lines, proper lookout. Those are the ingredients to know that something about getting, under the, getting underway was done effectively. And each um, element has that skill and proficiency in it as well. So 35 of those. And each domain has its set of these elements. And as we said, um, this is in the standard, but we also wanted to see if we could provide some tools to help people assess performance on the standard. So next slide. Well, each one of those elements has is a rubric. It's not part of the standard itself, but it's available for people who wish to use some tools to help assess performance on the standard. And so this is an example, again, in power, where the element is turn the boat at high speed by assuming a new heading 45 degrees port and starboard using appropriate throttle control. Let's look at the, the um, rubric itself has three levels, successful needs improvement, and unacceptable or unsuccessful. So next slide. At a successful level, you'll see a bit more description of what it looks like at a successful level. So steering the boat accurately, 45 degree turn, uh, starts and stops within desired headings, at the desired headings, uh, et cetera. So it has what it looks like at a successful level. Next slide. As you see, it goes down to needs improvement. It changes a little bit. So now they steer the boat through varying rates of speed. So it's not quite at the successful level. Or they may underturn or turn by you know, less than 15 degrees, not quite enough, uh, et cetera. So it describes some of the things you'll see at a needs improvement level. And then next slide. It also describes what you see at an unsuccessful level, where, for example, the boat might be you know, erratic through the turns or they, they understand even less than or more than 15 degrees way off, uh, dangerous um, shining of the boat, ventilation, et cetera. So you see what it looks like at an unsuccessful level. So it's three levels of performance aimed to describe a bit more of what's going on inside of the element itself. So every element will have a rubric with it as well. Next slide. So when we're done with the skills projects, we'll have the three standards, sail, power, and human propelled. We'll have the rubrics to help assess performance. And as we mentioned, we'll have some tools, detailed tools that instructors um, can use to calibrate consistent assessment of performance on the standards themselves. All, again, freely available, voluntarily applied. So I'll be on the, 
the onwaterstandards.org website and probably in other places as well. Okay, next slide. That's on the skill side, so you hear a little bit about that. We also have uh, Pam talked about the knowledge side. And Jeff talked about um, they, they must work together, and that is so true. So back to that notion of the continuum and ensuring that uh, the skill and the knowledge can be used um, together. Uh, if folks want to do that, we've been working as part of a collaboration initiative where we've been looking at what can we do to provide um, help to people like yourselves who want to use these, these standards to design really high-powered instruction. So a couple um, projects that have happened as a result of this initiative that was started by the, the Coast Guard. Uh, one thing we've done, for example, is we've done an analysis of the knowledge standards that have been created and the, still, the skill standards that's been created. And we held them side by side and analyzing them to make sure to see are there any conflicts between what's a knowledge standard and what's in a, a skill standard? And we found no conflicts, which we thought would be the case, but it's good we now have data to support that. But also where might there be gaps or overlaps? And then we can look at how we can help others, of course designers, course instructors, be able to line those standards up to build a high-powered course. And other skills as well, or other projects I mean as well. So a new sailing standard being created common portals that people can access information about both sets of, of standards, uh, et cetera. So some really powerful activities going on to make sure that what we create will be helpful to anybody who wants to use any combination of knowledge and skill-based standards. Next slide. When we're done with that, the collaboration priority we have as part of these projects is we've got to finish the full set of standards, the menu of standards, organize them so everyone can access them and use them. And then we got to get them out there being used because we don't want them to end up on, you know, as documents on websites or on bookshelves somewhere. It'd be great if they're actually being used, so available as sets of standards. Menu folks like yourselves can, can choose and use working together knowledge and skill to make it happen and having a national impact on safety and enjoyment uh, out in the waterway. So that's what the collaboration initiative is all about. Next slide. And again, back to the, the big picture, uh, all the, the full menu of standards, at least on knowledge and skill side that we've been chatting about here. Ron, have there been any questions? Yes, uh, we have a few. Uh, the first okay. is, are the results of the five sites um, in step four uh, available to read? Um, as a matter of fact, they are, at least for the Power Domain, which we did uh, back in 2013. There's a full report. The entire study uh, is posted on the onwaterstandards.org website. The okay. Human Propelled will be posted very shortly because we just finished it. It's in its final stages of voting. That should go up very, very shortly. Fail, we're just in the process of creating, so that will be put up as soon as it's done. But any report that we have produced as a result of this project is up on that website. Okay, and then we have two questions uh, asking uh, what is uh, high speed? How does the instructor assess that? Very good. Um, yes, high speed was the original phrase used. Um, what's also being produced is something called the technical support document, which is a, a much more detailed document that's going to be also made available to folks that will explain the content of the skill-based standards. So we'll be explaining terminology like high speed in that. High speed is, is actually more about uh, when someone is at planing speed, and it's uh, when they're out in open water traveling at, uh, when the boat is up on plane. That's the intention of that, of that language. But that will be explained in this technical support document, which will have a, a glossary on it. So how does someone identify planing speed is when the boat is up on plane. Okay. Uh, another question is, what does self-certified mean? Self-certified means that um, an individual or, or an organization has reviewed their instructional programming uh, in consideration of the standards and has been deliberate and explicit about identifying um, how their instructional programming um, is designed to accomplish what is identified within the standard. So it's a deliberate and explicit uh, intention to follow the standard and self-certifying means I can show evidence that I have or we have as an organization identified how our standard, how our instructional program is designed to deliver the standard or any parts 
of that standard. It means that someone will stand behind the notion that their instructional program delivers to the standard if they're ever asked or challenged by it. Uh, and we also have another one. Does NOWS call for consensus input uh, while developing these standards? Is there a place to review the documents, and how does one participate? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, all of it has been developed by consensus. Um, versions 1 through 4 is part of our uh, subject matter expert process in creating the drafts. But then when it officially goes out under uh, an ANSI-approved process, uh, ABYC, American Boat Yachting Comp uh, is helping us with that. Um, then people have the ability to formally submit comments about the um, standard that's under review, like what's going on right now that Pam described in the knowledge side. Where that's going to happen the, the next time on the skill side will be for the human propelled, because that's going to getting ready to go out, and that will have an opportunity for people to provide input. And then eventually that will also happen with the sale. The power has already been gone, has already gone through that process. Okay. Um, and one more. So uh, self-certified means that the state or agency can certify, not uh, the National On Water Standards Group? It means uh, on the skill side, what it means is the individual, the organization itself, is certifying that it is following or it is aligning to or adhering to the standard. So they're, they're taking it upon themselves to put forward the notion that they are following the standard to the level that they indicate. Okay. All right. Now states, I'm, I'm not sure if states have a different view on that. Pam, I don't know if you want to comment from a state perspective. Sure, and, and we're kind of getting into the conformity assessment um, portion of um, this, uh, not, not this webinar, but that question that comes up. Um, in the world of the American National Standards Institute, uh, ANSI, they actually recognize three forms of, um, of assessment, a conformity assessment to a standard. Self-certified is the, the lowest level, I would say. Um, it is the easiest, and as Brian absolutely correctly stated, uh, it's when the organization, the course provider, just builds a course curricula or you know, puts that together based on an existing standard. So they can label that, that this course uh, was designed to meet, and then of course um, add the title of the standard. That's a self-proclamation. They stand behind that. They would have to uh, they, they bear the responsibility of that statement, but it's certainly a way for them to recognize that they've met, uh, that course has been designed to meet the um, uh, American National Standard. A second party validation could be, and in this case it might be the state, that would look at that self-certification and say, okay, I, I'm interested in using your course or your product, but I personally, before I use your services, I want to do that comparison. So that would be a second party verification that a state could individually say, uh, show me, you know, bring, bring all your information, all your evidence into me, and before I hire you or recognize you, I want you to show me how you reached this conclusion that you met this standard. But that typically that second party is when they have an interest in using that. It could be an individual uh, boater who wants to go through that course that would, would ask for that opportunity to, you know, to basically have them prove it that they've gone through that. So that's a second party verification. The highest level of conformity assessment is a third party verification, and that's done by an entity who is not going to spe you know, specifically or personally use that standard for their own courses, but instead they are hired as that um, third party um, um, service that will look at this uh, content individually and say, yes, I'm personally not going to be offering a course 
that's meeting this, but for all of you that are going to do uh, are going to use this course, we have verified it meets that that standard. And I would say for those of you who have, are involved in the NASBLA approved course knowledge process, that's a third. That's an example of a third party um, conformity assessment that is done by NASBLA to meet that um, standard. So I hope that didn't confuse things. But okay, uh, one other question uh, that came in earlier was right after um, Joe's presentation. I'll throw this to any of the speakers. Uh, why were there two separate groups uh, developing uh, these standards, the knowledge and the skills? I, I will take that. And then uh, obviously uh, Joe or Jeff or, um, or Brian can, can join in. Um, the knowledge group was focused primarily on knowledge and uh, going through the ANSI process for the knowledge uh, component or the knowledge from the knowledge perspective, um, the skills program was uh, first. It it was a Coast Guard grant application that was based on the National Boating Safety Strategic Plan, and uh, U.S. Sailing put that initial grant application in, and based on U.S. Sailing's history of uh, not only sailing but uh, U.S. power boating is a subsidiary or a um, part of the U.S. sailing brand, but U.S. power boating had the history, a history of offering power courses, and the Coast Guard felt uh, that having that skill experience behind them uh, was an important component in awarding this grant. Okay. Um, those are all the questions that we have right now. Uh, we are at 3.01, and uh, to be respectful of everyone's time, I want to go ahead and just go over two quick things before we close this out. Uh, the standards are available uh, at the uh, URLs that you see there, nasblaorg slash ESP, and the uh, onwaterstandards.org. If you have any questions that we weren't able to get to today or as you think about them, please feel free to contact Pam or Brian. Their emails are there on the screen. And again, we'll be sending you a link um, in the next few days to this presentation, um, and you'll have this contact information. With that, I'd like to uh, thanks, uh, thank everyone for participating and let you know that the next webinar will be coming up on November 18th, and that's about the 2016 Spring Aboard Campaign take a boating course national marketing campaign planning for success. So thank you everyone, glad to have you and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron.